So, uh, you know, if you go to church long enough, uh, you sort of learn a code language that isn't really used in the outside world. You know, for instance, what most people would call a lobby, a lot of churches called a narthex for some reason. Uh, what, what most people would call a podium, we call a pulpit. And there's lots of examples. We have these seasons in like the Lutheran tradition called Epiphany and Pentecost that uh, most people don't know what they mean. And there are lots of examples of this kind of thing. Um, I remember experiencing this kind of dynamic a number of years ago. Uh, it was Christmas Eve and we were visiting relatives and we had at home as you do on Christmas Eve this amazing spread of food that we we're excited to eat uh, but first we were going to go to Christmas Eve worship and so off we went it was uh, to a Methodist church and we we, uh, we we went and took our pews and with us in this kind of big family group uh, were people who went to church and then there were some families among us who didn't very much go to church along with so-and-so relative who was probably nine or ten years old and so we sat down and I uh, I was kind of aware that this, this one kid had probably barely ever been to church in his life. Um, so I was kind of watching him and, and just seeing how he takes in and, and sees all these, uh, all these traditions. And so he was sort of like checking out the bulletin and looking at people wearing robes and, and uh, you know, looking around as people would stand up and sit down randomly and he didn't know why and trying to keep up. And then it came time for communion and the pastor was up there doing all the, the stuff for communion and sharing the words of institution. And eventually she invited people forward. She did the welcome and uh, she invited people forward to the altar, which she called the table, uh, to communion, which she called the meal. So, you know, she basically said, come to the table and receive the meal. And that's when our young relative kind of leaned over to us and he said, I'm not gonna have any food here. I'm gonna wait till we get home. <laughs> It was kind of a cute comment and, and it made us chuckle, uh, but it was a great reminder to me that the things we do and say in church sometimes need translation, uh, not because people are dumb, but because it's just outside of their language, it's outside of their experience. Well, you know, there's a similar dynamic that comes into play uh, when we encounter certain stories in the Bible and certain ideas, certain words. Uh, of course, there are some things in the Bible and there's some things that Jesus says that sort of we immediately feel like we understand and, and we can latch on to it. And some of these things are, are so beautiful, such, such amazing statements that, that are kind of universally inspiring that they've become popular and well-known among Christians, but even among non-Christians. You know, like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lots of people know Psalm 23, or at least some of that idea. Or, you know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Uh, or, or the two commandments, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Again, these things are nice and easy to hear and, and pretty easy to hold on to. But I think if we're completely honest, not everything in the Bible is like this. Uh, some of it's challenging. And it's challenging for different reasons. Some of it's challenging because we think we understand it, but what we understand about it is pretty unsettling. And we sort of don't know what to do with it. And then other parts of the Bible are challenging because we just don't understand it. It's as if it's speaking a code again, and we don't know how to decipher the code. And quite frankly, I think today's gospel includes both of these challenges initially, uh, because at first glance, it's both hard to live with and hard to understand. Uh, in this story, uh, Jesus is, is doing whatever he's doing, and people come to him and they start talking about two recent tragedies that happened in his area. Uh, the first was that the Roman governor of the, ki of the time who ruled that area, uh, Pontius Pilate, we'll meet him later in the crucifixion story, he'd apparently ordered the deaths of another number of Galileans. And we don't know why, you know, maybe they were rebelling against the Romans, who knows what, uh, but they, uh, they, they had been killed. And then the second tragedy was that apparently a tower had collapsed and fallen down on a number of people and, and killed some more people. And so these people kind of, have you heard about this? Bring these things to Jesus. And he responds uh, with, with this kind of concluding remark. He says, do you think they were worse sinners than all the others? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. You know, on first read, these words sound pretty harsh. You know, if we went to a funeral and the pastor stood up and said, we are gathered today to mourn the loss of so-and-so, and you will face the same <laughs> punishment if you don't repent, that would be a pretty hard message to hear, right? Not one I plan on giving. Uh, <laughs> but this is an example of a section of the Bible where we have to be very careful about how we interpret it. 
Because I think it's easy on first glance uh, to hear a story about condemnation. Uh, to hear Jesus saying that these people suffered because of their sins. But what's interesting is if you actually look at his actual words and read it carefully, it's exactly the opposite. right? He does not condemn them. He says that these people did not suffer because they were worse than others. Uh, in other words, their bad actions or good actions had nothing to do with the sad thing that happened to them. Instead, what Jesus is doing is something we probably wouldn't think to do in a situation like this, but he's using a very sad situation and turning it into kind of a teachable moment. Uh, he's, he's offering this tie, this uh, analogy uh, of literal destruction of these people's lives, that they died, and tying that in an analogy to the idea of repentance. The analogy is kind of this, unless we repent, we will likewise face destruction, which again, Sounds kind of harsh, but we, we again have to be careful here because when we hear the word destruction, I think our minds normally go straight to this idea that God is, is threatening us with hell, that that's all there is to this verse. But I think what Jesus is actually saying is a great deal more interesting and life-giving and deep than this kind of thought. Our problem, again, is that when we encounter some words in the Bible, we're kind of encountering a code that we don't, we don't speak the language that it was originally in, so we don't know what the words really meant. And the code word I'm talking about here is the word repentance. I wonder how you hear the word repentance. You know, most of my life, what I picked up and kind of absorbed from this person and just kind of how that word is, is shared, what I picked up was repentance means that you have to uh, feel guilty and stop doing bad things. Uh, maybe you were taught the same, right? Repentance is not doing bad things and kind of feeling the guilt of your actions. And of course, it's nice to try to avoid doing bad things. And, and there's something to be said in repentance to being aware of our, of our sin. So I don't want to totally knock that. But ultimately, I don't think this definition gets us very far for repentance to just be don't do bad things. Because telling someone not to do bad things does not cure the issue that we want to do bad things. Uh, that sometimes we don't even know they're bad when we're doing them. We're, we're pretty blind sometimes to our sin. More recently, though, I, I came across a, a teacher. I went to this talk, uh, this guy named Peter Stanky, where he was talking about the word repentance. And he kind of opened it up in a way that was uh, totally new to me and a lot more interesting. So uh, we're going to go into the Greek real quick. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Can you say metanoia? So it's a compound word. The first part, meta, means uh, beyond. And we kind of know that in English. Metaphysics means beyond what's physical, right? Philosophical or, or moral or whatever. Um, so meta is beyond. And then noia, we don't know that word, but it kind of sounds like a word. Noia, knowing. So no, uh, noia has to do with like thinking, your mind, uh, how you understand things. And so what this guy shared was that the, the literal way of thinking about this word is that repentance means to think beyond. Or the way he put it was to think big, to think bigger, right? To, to grow your mind. So Jesus in the Gospels, in this story and, uh, and others, is commanding us who are his followers to think big, to think bigger. You know, what an amazing commandment and what a more interesting thing than just don't do bad things. Think big, disciples of Jesus. And this is where I think the destruction stuff comes in. Because we as human beings are not that great at thinking big all the time. Uh, we tend to think in terms of things like selfishness and pettiness and revenge. And they did this to me and so I'm going to do this to them and I'm going to hold a grudge. Uh, we see in-groups who are good and out-groups who are bad and all the rest of our brokenness. And Jesus simply points out today that these ways of thinking, if this is your whole world and your whole world view, these ways are pretty destructive, right? This is what leads to a lot of the destru destruction in the world. And we know this, right? I mean, we can just look in the news and see the destructiveness of this tit-for-tat revenge, in-group, out-group kind of thinking. Or you can even look in your own life, your bad decisions you've made and I've made and others have made. Uh, we see that this kind of thing leads to destruction. And it's not so much then in this reading that God wants to put destruction on us. It's that we, when we think small and selfishly, are the ones who embrace destruction, who actually breed destruction in this world. And so Jesus' solution to this kind of destructive path is metanoia, repentance. Think big. Think in a bigger way than you usually want to think.
And you know, you have to think big to think like Jesus because the gospel is hard stuff for our egos. You know, loving enemies requires us to think big. It's not what we would initially want to do. Forgiveness, you know, letting go of the hurt, letting go of the blame and needing to be right uh, th takes thinking big. We have to have a certain amount of maturity in that. And being generous, right? Giving of what we have and not saying it's mine, 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 but seeing the bigger picture. That takes thinking big. So there's a challenge to thinking big. I heard a story once from a church leader who was, uh, the story goes, he was doing outreach in kind of an inner city uh, area uh, to, to troubled youths, uh, people, you know, who came from a background of, of uh, families that were kind of falling apart and drugs and gangs and stuff. But he had managed to somehow do some good outreach and form some relationships with these young people. And so one day he was sitting with several of them in a Bible study, and they were talking about the teachings of Jesus and this kind of thinking big. And we can think of some of the things he taught, right? Right? Uh, that, you know, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt for you and be, be generous, right? And there was this one troubled boy who was really engaged with this message, right? He could see his eyes were locked in. He was hearing it. He was wrestling with it. And all of a sudden, this boy picked up his fist and banged on the table really, really hard. And he stood up and he said, you mean following Jesus means doing all this really hard stuff? And this leader realized that despite the scary outburst and oh, you know, uh, <laughs> that this was something beautiful because this kid was actually hearing the gospel and taking it seriously. And a lot of times when we hear it, we just, okay, I hear it and out the other ear, but he was taking it seriously. This kid was getting that the gospel calls us towards not just hearing something and moving on, but transformation and thinking big. And so they talked about it some more. But it turned out that this kid had hit this little desk or whatever, this table so hard that, that he'd actually damaged it, like the, the leg broke. And the sad part of this story is that when some of the members of this church found out that the table had been broken, they came to this leader and started pressuring him to shut down the ministry, right, because of broken furniture. And he was trying to kind of engage this. And he said, you know, he's asking, really? So we're more concerned with a broken desk than this young man hearing the message of Jesus and love and grace. So again, it's, it's hard for us to think big. It's hard for us to get out of the narrow, small view. But you know, Jesus doesn't ask us to do it alone. And this leads us to the last section of our reading, which is that confusing parable at the end about the fig tree that's not producing. And again, I think this is a confusing section because it's code language. Uh, it means something else than what it says. And so here's a pretty simple code that you guys can be aware of. Pretty much any time in the New Testament when you read about fig trees, it's talking about the temple of Jerusalem, which for us is old news, but for them was very real. And this is a good thing to catch on to if you want to read the Gospels, because the fig tree thing comes up again and again and again. It's like, why are they always talking about fig trees? Um, fig tree is a metaphor for the temple. And so here's kind of the story. Previously, as we shared in the children's sermon, the Israelites had understood that God lives in the temple. And so if you wanted to connect to God, you had to go to the temple. You could pray and offer sacrifice and get forgiveness and all that stuff. And so in this parable, Jesus is foreshadowing that the temple system of connecting with God is coming to an end, right? It's no longer going to bear fruit. But this actually isn't bad news, he says. It's good news because as he says later, I am the temple. I am the presence of God. So instead of people going to one place, to a building, to a structure, to find God in the temple, to meet God, uh, the temple was coming to them in Jesus Christ. And so God's presence had broken loose. And in Jesus, God is now teaching people in his ministry to think big by living by grace. And then the final amazing twist in this story is what we shared in the children's sermon again, that the Bible tells us is that we are now the temples of God's spirit. You and I are the place where heaven and earth meets because Jesus' spirit, the Holy Spirit, can live in you. And that's why you have the power to think big and to live by grace. Not because you're so perfect, because you're not, and neither am I, but because we are all little temples of God's Spirit. God has invited us to be the place where grace happens. And why wouldn't we take God up on this offer? Amen. Let's continue as we rise in song.